Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast. The SANS 2021 report, Top New Threat, I'm sorry, Top New Attacks and Threat Report, sponsored by Anomaly, Blackberry, Cisco, Corelight, Domain Tools, ExtraHop, Logarithm, Rapid7, Sophos, and Threat Quotient. My name is Carol Auth of SANS. Today's featured speaker is John Pescatori, SANS Director of Emerging Security Trends. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenter, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to turn the webcast over to John. Thanks, Carol, and welcome, everyone. Welcome to one of my favorite things I do each year is write the SANS top new attacks and threat reports based on the SANS uh, panel at the RSA conference. We'll drill down to that in a bit. One thing I like to do every now and then in front of uh, webinars is see what else of interest happened this date in history. And today, a mere 155 years ago, the first transatlantic telegraph cable was successfully connected between uh, the United States, or actually Newfoundland, Canada, really, between North America and Europe. And uh, I looked into the bandwidth back then. That was pretty revolutionary. It used to take ships six weeks to sail between uh, the two continents to carry a, a letter, say, it would take six weeks. And once the transatlantic telegraph cable was connected for President Buchanan to send a message to Queen Victoria, they could send, a, they sent a 98 word message in a swift 16 hours which is a lot faster than six weeks, but boy, that makes the early days of acoustic couplers and modems and America Online CD-ROMs look fast. Just think we, we've really come far in 155 years. So anyway, with that little bit of, to me anyway, interesting history get out of the way, out of the way, let me tell you a little bit about what we're going to do today. I'm going to um, do a little opening and then uh, set the stage a bit. Then I'm going to go through the key recommendations from the SANS instructors on this on the RSA panel around the new and coming threats. And we're gonna talk a lot about each threat and mitigation um, at the level we can within a relatively short webinar here. We will be publishing the report and at the end, I'll give you a list of resources and um, uh, including the URL where you can get the report and other uh, related information from the SANS library as well. Um, this one's a little bit out of schedule this year. Normally the SANS conference is early in the year and uh, this past year was, of course, a virtual conference, and it was uh, later in the year. So we're doing this in the July timeframe. So we'll be uh, the trends I talk about will be sort of for the next year and a half versus just the remainder of 2021 to make that straight. But let me set the stage with the same slide. Oh, before that, um, as I'm going along, I'll be trying to watch the question window here. If you have questions about what I'm talking about or anything I didn't talk about, feel free to enter them in. Uh, the ones I can get to as I'm going along, I'll do that. We'll save time at the end for any questions I haven't gotten to or things that can, can come up to you towards the end. If you're watching a recorded version of this webinar, at the end, I'll give you an email address and you can send your questions uh, that email. And if it's for me or one of the instructors or whoever else in SANS or one of the sponsors for that matter, we'll get uh, the right person to give you the answer. So with that, let's get going. Whenever I do this type of thing, oh, and there's there's a little more advertising, but we'll have a panel discussion with uh, some of the uh, sponsors drilling down on some key areas on August 3rd, and uh, there's information for those of you who would like to attend that. Okay, now back now to the slide I use every year in this. I like to sort of put this in context because you know I've been at SANS about nine years now. Came from spending 14 years as Gardner's lead security analyst, and I spent my whole career in security. And information's nice, but information's got to lead to action. So where I like to put this is, you know, we're all hopefully um, doing threat intelligence and keeping up with attack and breach data as the year goes long and changes in regulations that are going to impact our programs. And this would be one other uh, input to that sort of information feed. And uh, sort of that falls on the side of threat analytics. What are the bad guys going to do? What are the top SANS instructors thinks the bad, think the bad guys will be doing? Um, and that's on the th sort of keeping up with the threat side. Obviously, you have controls analytics knowing where your gaps are, what the state of your vulnerabilities are, the state of your defenses are. And you always wanna be banging the threat, stand, threat status against the attacker status against your vulnerability status, and basically have meaningful situation awareness where it's accurate and fresh or recent information. But if you stop there, 
that's that's just voyeurism. This is a phrase I've used for many years. Just knowing things without doing thing any anything about it is just voyeurism. The the company, the government agencies, the taxpayers, they put money into our security programs to reduce damage, not to just monitor and create long reports or knowledge about the damage, why it happened, who did it, uh, but to wherever possible reduce the damage, either avoiding it or mitigating the risk. So the goal here is that you use this information in conjunction with other things other information sources down the years to be as proactive as possible in uh, pre-configuring things and, and, and closing the openings and minimizing risk well in advance of these future attacks we're going to talk about. So whenever I talk about trends, there's always three key areas that impact security programs. There's changes the bad guys do in their, their, what they do. Um, there's changes in regulations in recent years, GDPR in Europe, here in the US, the uh, just about every state, I think Texas is the latest one to jump in, adding in uh, either breach notification or other cybersecurity related regulation has been a big one. Probably in recent years, the biggest one's been changes in business models and the business demanding to use new technologies like cloud or um, uh, internet of things and so on. All of these impact our security programs. We're gonna focus obviously here today on the changes in the threats because that's the focus of the SANS RSA panel. Uh, but I, I did want to touch a little bit on the other ones as we go along, especially in this year where we're sort of we're in the COVID bubble for a year and now we're coming out and dealing with a different world, but not quite the world we left before the pandemic, but uh, sort of a new world we have to adapt to. So we kind of think about that, you know, for years we've been trying to keep up with the bad guys as they attacked our people working out of the offices and bang, all of a sudden everybody had to work from home. And so the job one for the entire company, and certainly for the IT organization and the security organization, was just to keep the business running, keep the ability for people to do their jobs as much as possible, for customers to get their goods and services and so on. And we saw IT really got consumed doing this. In fact, patch performance went way down on how uh, the time to patch servers. And uh, then the attacks started to go way up, taking advantage of how slowly they were patching VPNs and exchange and things across 2020. So job 1A, once we made sure we had the wheels on, on uh, the wheels kept turning, was to limit those risks to various crisis responses over 2020. And as things calm down to sort of turn those into processes and repeatable ways of doing things and new playbooks. And, and hopefully many of you are able to keep up with that level. As we start thinking about towards the end of 2020 and into 2021, as uh, the world began to stabilize a little bit anyway, vaccines started to come out and we're able to uh, get more people working and more things up and running in fuller capacities, um, increase, increasingly deliver stable services and stable processes, and then improve to get to address those gap areas where we're holding things together with sort of chewing gum and band-aids. And hopefully many of you are to that phase. I know many uh, smaller companies and many are still just in, stuck in job 1A for a while. Uh, but the reality is here in the fall, many schools and governments and businesses are going to try to return to having some number of people in the offices. SANS will start having more in-person training courses, for example, because our customers demanded it. And we're working with ways to do that to this new reality of hybrid operations where SANS used to be 70% in-person, 30% online. Then we went to 100% online training and 0% in-person. And who knows what the percentage will be? We'll have to support both and make sure both that everybody gets a quality training product out of SANS, just as your customers have that expectation, but also that it's done securely and safely and that we're living up to the privacy and confidentiality um, expectations our customers have of us. Um, and that'll be sort of hopefully the next reality. In years past, every time we've made a major transition, whether it was you know, changing versions of Windows or, or going from uh, uh, to, to, to using the cloud or going to Office 365 in the cloud versus Exchange in the data center, we've had this opportunity that many have taken advantage of to crank security up a level, to do things a little bit differently after that transition. And I think this is one of the opportunities to do that. I think this is a big opportunity to do that. And we'll drill down on that when we talk about the, the mitigations, the recommended mitigations. At the macro picture, there were kind of over the past year and a half, or since the last time we did this uh, threat, threat report, which was about 15 months ago, um, there's been sort of three seminal 
incidents that sort of define things. You know how, remember when Target got got uh, broken into, they were sort of the poster child for a year. These are sort of our poster children of uh, the, the ones that suffered attacks. So obviously solar winds was huge. We knew for years there was an issue around supply chain security. Um, the Solar Winds Act pointed that out in a very big way. Uh, Ed SCOTUS and the threat panel focused on that, and I'm gonna drill down on uh, sort of a larger category that includes that, that Ed defined and the things that need to be done there. Probably right after that, uh, and in time more recently, was the Colonial Gas Pipeline ransomware attack. Not because it was ransomware, but because for the first time at scale, um, normal people were impacted by a denial of service attack in a way that just didn't say, oh, I'll come back in five minutes or 10 minutes. They could not get gasoline for their cars. Things were not showing up at the stores. The impact of failures in cybersecurity were enormous. And then later on, the JBS meat, meatpacking one was sort of a smaller example. Um, so uh, Katie Nichols drilled down on uh, ransomware um, attacks and, and new methods and what the reality means, and we'll be touching on that here as well. Um, here more recently, in the past couple of weeks, it came out that an uh, Israeli company that sold spyware to be used by governments, their software was found on thousands of Android phones and iPhones um, of many famous people and many high priority targets. And I'm, I'm sure there's more to be found there. This is an area that last year and this year, Heather Mahalik focused on on uh, the, the risks of, uh, of um, mobile phone applications and mobile applications in general. And we'll drill down on that. And then you'll see uh, sort of some another area that uh, Johannes uh, Ulrich focused on that'll come into play is really something looking towards the future. Um, so those are the ones that probably your board of directors and your CEO, or your agency heads heard about. And I think you'll see direct connections to all of those and many of the recommendations here. But I always like to start this off by looking at some of the data on the, the threats and breaches that did happen over the past time frame. And one I've used every year for many years is the Identity Theft Resource Center, which has been pretty consistent. They've changed a little bit of the way they present the data, but they've done it in a, a very uh, consistent um, methodology over the years that's very open and transparent. What you see on your screen there is the quarters, first quarter 19 on the right, then 20, 20 in the middle, 2021 20, on the left. And they have two columns, the number of breaches and then how many individuals were impacted total across those breaches. And if you look down at the, towards the bottom at the blue line, individuals affected per breach, you can see that in 20, first quarter of 2019, 1.2 million, almost 1.3 million people per breach was the norm. And that rose to 4.7 million per breach last year in, in the first quarter of 2020. And this year it's down dramatically. The average breach size is down to 139,000 records per breach. In, in more stable years, I would use data like that to say, you know, enterprises are reacting more quickly. They're uh, catching things before large scale breaches happen. But really what happened this year was a lot more smaller, two things happened. A lot more incidents being smaller breaches and a lot more breaches being ransomware and denial of service that often had breach components. We'll get to that in a bit, but often did not. But also you need, we need to look one step below the macro level of the data as well and see particular industries. If you look on their financial services up towards the top, they had huge growth in both particularly in the records for breach, there was still some really huge credit card and financial services exposures in 2021. You can see the same for healthcare um, growth there, obviously the focus on attackers going after the vaccine supply chain and the pharmaceutical information before the vaccines came out played a, played a big role there. Uh, the one I think is probably the scariest and, and uh, the one we've certainly heard the most from, if you look at the nonprofit NGO, non-governmental organizations, you can see in uh, 2019, they had under 10,000 individuals impacted and a very small number of breaches. And in the first quarter of this year, they had a close to half a million and more than almost four times as many breaches. And you see other industries went down, uh, but those are three particular areas where they went up. And you can see technology and hospitality, hotels and the like were obviously not very attractive targets during the uh, pandemic. Now, you look at some other data, you sort of get to see those some, some of those trends. This is from Microsoft's uh, annual defense report. And you can see that, uh, Phishing continued to be the front end. BEC is business email compromise attacks. So phishing continued to be the front end of most attacks. You see the top 10 targeted industries list pretty much lots of the industries I just talked about um, that were impacted, that, that showed growth in the attacks. But I think it's interesting. You look at the top five spoof brands. Those are pretty big brands. And then you'd say, why would, 
why would you spoof Amazon's brand or UPS brands? Well, obviously, people getting things delivered to their houses during the pandemic, lots more packages than normal, a little more uh, uh, fear and, and uh, worrying about would the package get there and clicking on things more quickly. Whoops, that really wasn't UPS or Amazon. That was phishing software or malware getting installed on the front end. What really happened over the past 15 months, uh, certainly over 2020 and, and continuing into 2021, is a lot more highly targeted attacks where the threat actors are aiming at highly privileged users or, or CXO type users or boards of directors doing a lot more research and a lot even, even more customization of those phishing attacks for very specific, very high level targets. Certainly the Pegasus spyware is an extreme example of that, but I mean, even outside of that, just the uh, many of the uh, ransomware attacks you saw started with very, very targeted um, attacks that privileged people that would give quick access to uh, the, 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 the internal targets. And this issue about brand spoofing um, is just taking advantage of, look at Zoom. How many, how many attackers were targeting Zoom in, 20, Zoom in 2019? Uh, and it, it made the top five list. So bottom line, and this is validated by um, the, the next slide with the data from the Verizon data, data breach investigation report. Phishing attacks continue to be by far the biggest first step in compromising a target to lead to these other form attacks, whether they're breaches or ransomware. And these target, the phishing are succeeding for the major, mainly for the reason we're still using reusable passwords in too many places. That's the target, get those credentials. Some of the phishing attacks are doing the, you know, click on this URL and try to get malware implanted that way, but the vast majority are still obtaining credentials and then the game is over. Um, and then of those credentials they get, 80% of the, those uh, credentials they are, have been able to get are privileged credentials or they're able to abuse the privilege of regular user levels and get them elevated access because privilege management capabilities weren't up to snuff in the target. So ransomware obviously caused the press, ca caught the press's imagination in uh, 2020 and tw into 2021. The Colorado Pipeline one just got so much publicity and ransomware and uh, the idea of a ransom and Bitcoin, it's just a really cool topic for the mainstream press to get. When I go through Katie Nichols' recommendations, we're gonna emphasize that the majority of ransomware attacks in the past two years have also been breaches, have also included data, data exfiltration. So when you look at the top line, the numbers look better um, as far as smaller breaches are happening and not as many breaches and the like, but the breaches that did happen were much more focused, much more damaging. And uh, to the businesses that were hit, it's no, cons no consolation that uh, others had smaller impacts. So bottom line is the, the danger level certainly did not go down in the past year or so. So before we start talking about the advanced threats and some of the mitigation, just have to reemphasize that um, just every one of these data sources you can look at, including what you see from coming from uh, Department of Homeland Security or the Australian equivalent or the European equivalents, the bottom line is essential security hygiene, I'm using the critical security controls here as the example, is still key to protecting your business, your government agency. Not just to be compliant, not just to show how oh, they said we have to comply with the, the NIST cybersecurity framework or the payment card industry or ISOs, uh, whatever. Um, it's, it's, you can't even think about advanced threats until you have basic security hygiene in place. You, you hear a lot of hype around zero trust these days. You can never get to a zero trust architecture until you essentially implement all of the what are now 18 critical security controls and version eight of the critical controls. Um, you know, it's like building a house. You need that basic structure, prepare the ground, put a secure foundation in before you can think about what should I put in the kitchen and the trim and the, the shingles I'm going to use. Um, critical security controls maps to the NIST cybersecurity framework, which maps to every other standard. It doesn't really matter which one of these three major frameworks you take, you choose. Um, but you got to start with one and you have to be able to be aware of where your gaps are and have something like this to uh, base your analysis on and base arguments to management that you need to close those gaps. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to do here for the next section is sort of summarize the key parts of the uh, panel. You see the all of uh, five of them up there was hosted as usual by Alan Paller, um, Ed Scotus, who's been a long-term uh, top SANS instructor and sort of the father of the pen test curriculum and the NetWars program went first, and then uh, followed by Heather Mihalik, who focuses on the mobile side of things, and in particular, mobile forensics. Uh, 
Johannes Ulrichs run the SANS uh, Internet Security Center for many years and is now the Dean of Research of the SANS Technology Institute as well. A new member of the panel this year is Katie Nichols, who's a senior instructor at SANS, and she's also the principal intelligence analysis at, at Red Canary and has some great insight. So I'm going to go through each one again as I'm going along. If you have some question about where I am in particular or anything up that comes to mind, enter the question and I'll try to answer it as we go. So it started essentially by talking about what's commonly become called now supply chain attacks. So the idea is, let's use SolarWinds as an example. SolarWinds, I didn't attack Acme Company to get at Acme Company. I attacked SolarWinds and compromised SolarWinds, who's a supplier, a software supplier to Acme, to get into Acme. Um, so that sort of puts everything, just about every piece of software sold can be considered if it's compromised it could be part of a, of a supply chain attack you know vulnerabilities in windows it's a little different vulnerabilities in windows were built in by microsoft and then we have to patch and shield them from attackers directly attacking our copy of microsoft but if microsoft software development um, repositories and processes were compromised the way solar winds was we'd be happily updating windows each month and, and bringing in Malicious payloads, just like what happened with the SolarWinds Orion software. But Ed put this under a broader category called software integrity, which I think is a smart thing to do. The real issue is how can we trust any software we buy or write um, that it hasn't been either written insecurely or compromised? This gets even more important when you look at just about every piece of software, every application your business is using today really consists of dozens of packages, um, dozens of routines and services that are linked together to, to, for the application to do its, its total of what it does. There's often open source components, library components, things from GitHub, other internal reuse code. And so this has become called, and Ed points it out, dependency confusion attacks. A simple example is um, in one of the papers referenced in the report, the idea that internal to companies, and I think this happened to both uh, Netflix and Tesla in one of these uh, dependency confusion attacks. Um, you write some internal software that calls internal routines, uh, but the way things work is they check for those internal package names. If they don't find them there, they look out into public repositories, the GitHubs and other, other places where um, packages are publicly stored or, or um, uh, uh, made available. And if it finds it there, then it uses that version. If it finds it in both places, quite often the default is use the latest version number. So attackers have ways to say, that's interesting. If I can find out about that, and then I can put my malicious version out in the public repository with a higher version number, I wonder if the, uh, the top level application really pulled my malware. Oops, look, it did. Hmm, now where can we go from there? So this idea of defendancy confusion attacks has been demonstrated and has happened and has been used in real, real world attacks. Um, Ed points out a simple example. I never thought about this. Typo squatting is an example of a dependency confusion. The user thinks they're entering in sans.org for training, but they really answer, enter in sans.net or sans, uh, by, by mistake, sans with two S's at the end. And somebody squatting on that typo it's kind of a similar type attack it's another dependency confusion type thing um, so as i pointed out you know everything's using different libraries and components and modules and, and any one of those can get compromised and then propagate out to multiple products using it and the bottom line is there's still traditional rootkits out there that we have to worry about that can, can infect the repository the servers that repositories are on or our uh, software development environments and the like so this is a foundation he calls it a foundational hard problem this, this is kind of like many other problems that we we sort of knew were out there, we hoped would never hit us, but uh, then yeah, it did turn out somebody figured out how to exploit buffer overflows we left in code for many, many years. So how do you mitigate this type of thing? So as, as I pointed out earlier, the first thing is pretty much Security 101. It's the implementation group run of the critical security controls is having an asset inventory of all the softwares that, that's out there, knowing which version should be where, um, knowing that the right pieces of software are in use and only the right pieces of software are in use and knowing that the ones that are known vulnerable are protected and so on. It's usual security 101. 
Um, a newer thing that's uh, come out, and actually it's been proposed for a couple of years, it was mentioned by name in President Biden's executive order, so you'll, you'll see a lot more pull coming from the government side, is the idea of a software bill of materials. This is the idea that all code you buy should essentially include, oh, well, think of it kind of like a vaccination certificate, um, to include a, um, a digital certificate that lays out information. You see it in the illustration there of one of the proposed standards, SPDX, um, that it would include the creation information, the information of the particulars of the package and files included in relationships with other software, might include proof that it was tested by a certain version of a security vulnerability testing tool or service as of a certain date and found to be clean. And then all this information would be bound to the executable in a way that if uh, SolarWinds did an update and somebody compromised the update, but they could not compromise the uh, uh, software bill of materials side of things, then you'd have the opportunity to say, wait a minute, we're not loading this update. The, the SBOM, the software bill of materials information and the executable itself don't match. That's kind of a glorified or, or much more thorough and complex approach of an older concept we used to call Tripwire when it was a product known as file integrity monitoring, which is the idea of being able to detect any time a change is made to an application. And if, if you could not find a, uh, an authorized change, a change to that application being authorized to be that, you'd revert to the previous version or the known good version. So Ed points out file integrity monitoring is something that can be used to say, wait a minute, why did this change and have we tested it to make sure um, this change was uh, authorized and tested and blessed? And then he pointed out, uh, let's use SolarWinds as an example. You know, once the bad version of SolarWinds Orion was installed and operational, it was doing things SolarWinds did not used to do. So threat hunting, looking around for unusual things going on in the network, trying to say, wait a minute, why all of a sudden did this piece of software start trying to look for SSL servers or communicate to these unknown URLs or IP addresses we'd, we'd never heard of before? Um, so threat hunting is something that if we can't trust the software we're installing, which bottom line is we can't, um, then threat hunting to be more proactive and quickly detecting something unusual is really key. And then finally, you sort of combine all that together in the idea of purple teaming, where our red teams are doing penetration testing and trying cool new things like dependency confusion attacks. Um, and we can see if the blue team, the defensive side can detect that. And if they can, and if they find ways to counter it, then the red team can say, well, okay, now what do we do? And by both sides learning from each other, the purple team can stay ahead of the uh, bad guys out there. Um, so that's sort of some of the key uh, elements. And it's, as I said in the report, it's expanded on uh, the recommendations. So Heather, talking about mobile applications in general, and this was uh, this panel was done before the Pegasus um, report, Pegasus information came out about the, uh, the uh, smartphone spyware being rampant from uh, NSO in Israel. Um, Heather talked about applications in general today, and certainly mobile applications today, aren't monolithic. So when you authenticate into the application in your phone, it then has to communicate with a server on the mobile application side, which has to communicate to other servers and other things. There's lots of app, app or process to process communications going back and forth. And every time a backend process needs to ask the user something, they don't want the user to have to re-authenticate. So what's evolved as the way to handle that is uh, the applications create a token, um, essentially a, a small file or digital certificate that has the, carries the user's credentials and privileges and maybe some timestamps about how long this is valid. And it gets passed between application and application or process and process to allow the full string of processing to be done without requiring the user to log in all the time. It's a well-known way of doing this. It's been done since the mainframe days. It's easy to talk about. It's not that easy to do well, uh, especially in today's environment where everything's traveling over public networks and is visible and people are using browsers that include lots of information and allow bad guys to try lots of things out. So the bottom line is attackers have figured out ways to um, tamper with or interfere with or corrupt this token process, which then enables them to sort of be, whether it's man in the middle type attacks against these applications or break into them, um, it's enabled them to do that. So some of this, you can see some of the ways things are done in the, uh, for, for example, the Pegasus spyware take advantage of this. So there are other attacks that Heather, Heather points out um, have, have succeeded in the real world on, in many ways. And this rush to work from home caused many businesses to use way more mobile applications or cloud-based applications 
that use this process and often were from consumer grade companies. You know, if you think, well, I'm not, I don't want to pick on Zoom, but think about Zoom um, in early 2020. They were not really an enterprise class application. In fact, quick as their usage Zoom during the quarantine, to his credit, the CEO of Zoom said, okay, we did not do the job in security. We're doing a sort of Bill Gates like one month, put the pencils down and we're focusing on security. Here's our timeline. And they did a great job of filling the gaps and putting in the right processes and, and uh, capabilities in the product and cleaning things up. But many other smaller companies that were consumer grade applications that began to be widely used by enterprises and widely attacked by attackers were slower or unable to do so. So when you think about the risk there, and again, you can drill down and reading the whole report, there's some common sense things uh, Heather points points to um, when after some timeout period, if the application is not being used, force log off and the user will have to log back in again. Where the tokens are given some time stamp of their active life, choose the smallest possible period possible uh, that you can live with in the token in the life of the tokens. Minimize the privileges of the user of all the pieces in the chain to only the level of access and privileges need. And one thing in common here with what Ed talked about, you think back to the uh, secure bill, uh, software bill of materials, the idea that uh, somewhere in that uh, bill of materials will be an attestation that this software was tested for known vulnerabilities using this service and of this date and the results were valid as of this date. Um, similar type thing for all mobile applications require that your teams that are developing mobile apps or the people you're buying apps from to show proof that that software has been tested by no, the large number of uh, application vulnerability testing products out there that at least it's got to run to say for all known vulnerabilities as of this date, this code did not have them. Um, but the, on the right, by the way, is the illustration is just the Gardner Magic Quadrant of, of that space, the application security testing space. And you can see there's plenty of things to choose from there. So I'm going to move on to um, Johannes Ulrich's portion of the panel. Johannes focused on an area that's been pretty hyped up. Uh, Dave Holzer and I did a session at this RSA conference on sort of the hype and reality of machine learning. Machine learning in the past couple of years has sort of become the turmeric or the penicillin of the security industry. Every vendor sprinkles some machine learning on their product. Um, and it's, you would think it has magical magical properties. Um, so the vendors have been kind of overhyping it. Even the vendors that really are building legitimate machine language um, models or algorithms or software into their products, they're not very transparent about it. It's a black box that's doing something in there. And then decisions are coming out. Is this malware? Is this not malware? Is this normal behavior? Not normal behavior. So what Jonas, Johannes sort of been this was pre-deployment machine language trust is what do we know about what's actually being done in these products trumpeting machine learning? And how can we compare them? If every vendor is saying, they, I use machine learning, well, give me some details um, so that I can compare them. For example, at Gardner and here at Santa, in the past nine years at Sands, I always recommend ask every single vendor saying they're using machine learning, show me the tests and show me false positive and false negative performance. Because it's easy for a machine learning algorithm to show zero false negatives. We found every instance of this type of attack. Well, wait a minute, show me the false positive information. How often did you call, call legitimate applications or legitimate um, usage um, signs of this attack? The other thing that we're going to spend more time on here that Johannes uh, really dug down into is, okay, now I'm using machine language and the bad guys know it. And in fact, they can buy the same products I can and they can reverse engineer those products and understand how those algorithms or models work. And they've already come up with ways to attack them, to influence them. So the diagram here in the middle is sort of the standard cartoon for machine learning. And the most commonly used one is supervised learning where we feed the models known good data, known bad data. And from that, they can we feed them unknown data, and then they can classify them and say, this looks good or this looks bad, or other ways they can sort of connect the dots and say all these are, um, the next likely thing to happen would be this, that's the regression one. But typically, classification is uh, what's done in supervised learning. So you, uh, for the attacks against those type of things, Reverse engineering says, okay, you're using Acme's machine language based uh, endpoint detection and response. I can buy a copy, I can instrument it, and I can figure out what it's doing. And then I can send you a stream of malware, and I'm sending that same stream of malware to my product. 
my copy of the product and I'm looking to see how the indicators change. And based on that knowledge, I'm going to craft an attack that I'm pretty sure your copy of this product is going to classify as safe. So that's sort of a reverse engineering attack. Um, all the vendors will, will talk about, you know, well, there's ways we can fight that type of attack as well. Um, but there's, how do we know you're, they're really doing that or not? And then the, this is obviously just like the rest of the chess game in security. The bad guys do this, good guys do that. The bad guys can do something else. Another key point is for all any security products where we're going to try to do any sort of active prevention, or even the ones we're just doing inspection, at some point the data rates can exceed the capacity of the product. So then we have the choice of then what do we do? Do we fail closed? where if we can't inspect the traffic, nothing gets through, or do we fail open? Um, we don't want to disrupt business, so if we are overloaded, we'll pass all the traffic and business can continue. Obviously, there's two different types of risks there. Failing closed means we're going to disrupt the, uh, the business ourselves. Failing open means if the bad guys attack during that period, uh, we have the risk of that getting through. So that's another attack that when, when machine learning is known and used, you know, think about denial of service used to be a brute force type attack of denial of service to just pound on your internet connection with high bandwidth botnets and things. Um, and then we figured out how to deal with that. Well, then they switched to resource consumption attacks, which said, ah, I see you have a search function on your website. If I do a search for star dot star, it starts consuming all kinds of resources. Oh, I see you have a new user creation file uh, form. That consumes all kinds of resources as well. So they came up with resource depletion attacks, which is something they could do similar to the security things using complex algorithms or models such as machine learning or other AI-based capabilities. So as far as some mitigations for that, the number one thing is understanding how machine learning works, what its strengths are, what its weaknesses are, what its weaknesses are, and controlling training data, treating training data like you would treat any critical executable or in having change control and change logging and making sure you're not leaving this opportunity for somebody to influence the training data. Um, if you're start just looking at products like uh, endpoint detection and response or any of the other new buzzwords for things using machine language, ask the vendors for inf detailed information about how the model works and the data they have in testing it for false positives and false negatives. The, the truth of machine learning is it's not you just feed data, throw data at it and everything takes care of itself. There's lots of tuning to be done. There's tuning to be done in choosing is your network currently running good if you're going to use your current good network for training data. Um, just tuning your <laughs> network, you have to have the skills to be able to say, yeah, my network's clean right now. But in these, these products, there's always tuning to be done. It's not simply feed data and let them do whatever they think is. Um, and beware of the products that only give you false negative data. Say, yeah, look, we never missed an instance of this. That's like anti good old signature-based antivirals saying, see, we never missed an instance of this file. Well, yeah, but they changed one letter in the in the code and you missed it. You show me the false. And, and by the way, you had zero false negatives and that are, zero false positives in the signature approach, but you had thousands of false negatives. So you have to look at both sides. Glorified signatures can be all false positives, all false negatives but great at doing one single thing. That's not what you want to buy. So Katie focused on really on ransomware, um, but I think it's key to, some of the things she pointed out are pretty key to make sure you get it across the management. As I said, ransomware has captured the press information, captured all the headlines, but really for over two years now, the majority of ransomware attacks have included data exfiltration. Um, in recent years, that's been used more, to say, oh, you're not going to pay the ransom? Okay, we're going to drip, drab, release the data. Uh, but they have, for years now, they have not just been denial of service and backup, having good backup data is necessary to recover after a ransomware attack, but it's no longer sufficient. It'll just mean, okay, we got out of the DDoS, the denial of service side, but now we have a major breach going on. Um, and for several years in the US, the HIPAA compliance regime and more recently the GDPR regime and have considered ransomware to be you lost control of your customer's information, that equals a breach. Now GDPR didn't did not require disclosure, uh, but it had ways of finding and now in Europe they're push, pushing out disclosure type language around the, the updates. Um, but pretty much ransomware does not just mean a denial of service event, if I get the decryption key, I can uh, recover and everything's good. That doesn't work that way anymore in any of these attacks. And the bottom line is, 
negotiate. We have a whole separate thing. Uh, ben Wright and a SANS instructor and I did a SANS presentation. I mean, an RSA presentation as well as SANS presentations around cyber insurance and negotiating with attackers and the like. And it's, there's not a great lot of success stories out there in doing so. And the bottom line is, depending on criminals, let me pay the bad guy to undo the damage and and then my life will be good again. That's That hasn't worked in the physical kidnapping days. It's certainly not working in the ransomware days. So the bottom line is the, the most successful cyber insurance policies are the ones where you never use because you were able to protect yourself for the majority of uh, the issues and for ransomware, Again, working on that front end, whoops, I think, let me go to the next slide here. Katie, Katie points out a number of mitigation things. So when you look at sort of the, the ransomware attack chain, you see the typical attack chain, the attackers are using a lot of common packages in the different steps along there. And if you remember from last year's threat reports when Ed Scotus focused on living off the land attacks where the bad guys would increasingly use what was common packages, things that were built into our Windows PCs or came with our applications or web servers or uh, uh, code hub type things, repositories and the like. And Katie particularly points out in that exfiltration stage, common tools like our clone and the mega command server are often used by the bad guys because those are tools used for uh, file sharing and, and uh, the mega, mega cloud service for both encrypting information and, and the collaboration or, or sharing files across that cloud service. Um, so in the mitigation side of things, you certainly have to focus on the front end of phishing for every attack. Use the publicity around ransomware to go after multi-factor authentication, reduce reusable passwords, lower the number of privileges the, that are routinely given out and so on. But as part of your threat hunting or other detection type activities, Looking for those common tools and any renamed executables in use is a key sign this could be happening. The faster you can react, um, the faster you can start mitigation or assuring at least that your backups do stay um, uncompromised because many of these ransomware attacks are compromising backups as well. And the bottom line is, use as I mentioned earlier, use this publicity to say our goal should be we should never be put in the position where our, our best alternative is to try to negotiate with the attackers. Uh, we'll be having other seminars around cyber insurance. That world's changing quite a bit on whether the insurance policies will even pay for ransom payments anymore anyway. So that's that side's not uh, not as simple as it used to be uh, either. Um, oops, remove my question. See, there we go. Okay, so we went through the uh, panel. I want to go into sort of the longer term advice and the uh, um, some key things that Look at the broader picture. So you saw in each of these threat areas, each of the SANS instructor had, instructors had some key mitigation approaches, um, and there were some common threads across them. So, you know, in security, the losing game is to say, oh, there's a new threat. There's botnets out there. There's rootkits. We, we, we've got to do something different for them. No, the best way is to look for a framework that addresses the common ways attackers um, launch those threats or the common ways they reach vulnerabilities and come up with security processes and controls that deal with the majority of those active threats. So certainly on the left-hand side here, um, what you see 1 through 18, that's version 8 of the critical security controls. On the right-hand side, it's a little hard to see. I squeezed it onto one slide. That's the uh, attack, MITRE attack method of doing a gap analysis of a threat against your defenses, which is a pretty cool way to go. We've seen, we've seen rapid adoption of that. The bottom line is, you know, earlier I said starting with a framework, now doing some sort of gap analysis to say, okay, based on reality of how we are protecting ourselves, where do we have our biggest gaps? Now, I have to point out one weakness of this sort of gap approach. If you, if you look, you, what doesn't leap out at you in here is multi-factor authentication. I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, we really have to use this transition back to, you know, hybrid work and, and hopefully back to more normal world here the next year um, and the publicity around ransomware to start chipping into where reusable passwords are used. Um, certainly sysadmins and other privileged users on critical applications, certainly on cloud services, certainly on cloud service providers and when we outsource things, driving that out there. But doing the gap, moving beyond that, doing the gap analysis on your own project protections and seeing which ones will give you the most bang for the buck against most of these uh, threat paths and tools, techniques and processes. Really the bottom line is what you want to do is try to get a broad hardening program going, effort going. I've sort of pounded on passwords enough and reducing privileges saying, do we really need uh, the, the ability to run any application anywhere? Um, can we do some sort of whitelisting? Maybe not the whitelisting where it's only the applications IT is paid for, 
because they don't know uh, better than the users do most days what applications they'll use, but at least ones that have shown evidence of security testing or have a software bill of materials or um, we can fit into an application control framework that Windows supports or Linux supports or other things support. Can we upgrade our endpoint protection? Are we still living off of what's really signature-based protection with claims of having machine learning built in, or can we move to more powerful products on the endpoint that give us not just more response capability, but more visibility into the endpoint and the ability to do more detailed threat hunting with reasonably skilled analysts uh, to get much more consistent advanced endpoint protection. Can we start taking advantage of uh, some of the information coming in through DNS and our web security gateways of, do we really need to let the first attempt to go to a URL that's never been seen before happen? Can we get more aggressive on that side of things or at least alerting when that happens? Um, there's so many things that that, that that aperture could be narrowed down. I mentioned purple teaming, we'll touch on that again. And then sort of I put at the bottom of the list, once we've attacked multi-factor authentication, once we've got more dependable credentials on people, the ability to say, we can encrypt records, we can, we can encrypt sensitive files and still share them across users, across business units, across applications. That's a longer term plan, but what I've seen is a lot of the, the app dev side and the business unit side now has privacy as one of their business requirements, one of their user requirements, because of things like GDPR and the increasing state-by-state -state laws here in the US and maybe, maybe a national law in the US as well. Um, but th th now's a good time to start investigating. We, how would we as the security program offer a control for persistent data encryption that could be a process and controls that could be used across the organization and across the business units? So sort of nearing the, the end of the time session here, um, so I'll sort of sum up by just pounding on it again, you know, the basic or essential security hygiene is still what needs to be in place. It's still the biggest bang for the buck way of raising the bar against so many of these attacks. There's some really sophisticated attacks. You know, the solar winds attack, the, the way the Pegasus spyware worked, just doing essential security hygiene may not stop those, although it would definitely have increased the odds that you would notice more quickly. Um, or that solar winds would have noticed more quickly, or that uh, other other uh, cell phone things would stand out more quickly. Not going to, not, not basic security hygiene is not going to take care of those. But by putting that in place, you then have a foundation. To start adding some of these recommendations that that Ed and Johannes and, and uh, Heather and Katie made to 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 deal with these new emerging threats. Um, most of the uh, the threats we talked about are taking advantage of. Things that we, the business did or IT did to meet business needs. These are not simply things we can say, okay, turn that off, stop doing that. Uh, we will not allow that provider to connect to this network. It's, it's, it's to make the business work. These things had to be done. Sort of like early on, everybody wanted to say, don't use Zoom. That didn't last very long. Uh, we had to make it make, had to make it work. Um, so attack reusable passwords. I hit enough. Did have a question come in. What is your opinion of Microsoft NIST password methodology of changing passwords rarely, like once a year? So first off, if you've got if you've largely eliminated reusable passwords and gone to two-factor authentication, you really don't have to worry about changing passwords as often. Microsoft put out a research report last year. I think it was last year. It might have been earlier this year. It's hard to keep the years straight these days. Just using simple cell phone text message type second-factor authentication would have eliminated, would have uh, stopped 99.9% .9 of the phishing attacks Microsoft detected uh, globally the, the year before. And that's, we all know text messaging, there's ways uh, ways to get around it, the token uh, session, weak session security, uh, Heather mentioned that that can often disrupt two-factor authentication, there's ways around it. Uh, but just stopping 99.9% .9 of the attacks, simply that text message authentication stuff would stop them. Um, so the, the bottom line is, before I answer your question more straightforward, um, the answer is not how how can we make reusable passwords more secure. You can't. The user is going to give them away. Doesn't matter whether you reset it every week, every month, or every year. If the user is giving it away, the game's over. Um, so it's, I think what you're seeing is a lot of the the the, pre, the sort of compliance approach to security was yes, you must change passwords quarterly, monthly, whatever. Uh, that did not increase security. We, we did not see that change any of our problems um, when, that, when that started to come about in the Sarbanes-Oxley days through today. So changing passwords faster 
um, we already know to do it quickly enough would be so frequently that it would drive the user nuts. Um, and reusable and things like text messaging are much more acceptable. I do boards of directors briefings, and I always ask the boards of directors and the C CEOs, hey, do you use two-factor authentication on your home banking program? And they go, oh, yeah, sure. On your stock program? Oh, yeah, sure. Do you use it at work? No, we don't have it at work. So people at home are using fingerprint authentication on their phones and using text messaging on eBay and Venmo and PayPal and any other sensitive things they have, yet at work we're still shying away from it. So bottom line is, um, Changing passwords faster is not the answer to any problems we have today, and it hasn't been. Um, I see another question came in. I'll get to that in a second. Other things, we see a lot of talk that there's a bajillion jobs open in cybersecurity today. What, what we see is most companies are hiring to get the skills. They don't necessarily need 10 junior analysts. They need a couple people with the skills for securing things in the cloud or securing containers or doing things in this new um, uh, this new software pipeline type approach or, or dealing with this now mobile application type problem. Um, so look to the skills your company needs in security or the lacks in your team. Obviously, SANS is a training company. We win either way. You can hire lots of people and we'll train them for you. Uh, but I think if you're gonna focus on doing things right now, finding the skills gaps and upskilling the people to deal with the current threats and the current technology and uses is, is really key. The biggest success stories the ones that don't show up in the press because they didn't get hit by ransomware, they avoided it or they survived it, are the ones where the security manager, the CISO or the security team was able to make friends in the other group, able to make friends in app dev and get software vulnerability testing built into the app dev process or get the pre-configured uh, AWS images built into the way cloud would be done, use the secure suite images from CISO or whatever. With procurement, get them to require or at least ask in all procurements, have you tested your software and so on. Chief legal officer, hey, ransomware is a bad thing. Cyber insurance is, here's what would happen if we had to use it. Here's some things we could do if we could encrypt data, blah, 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 blah. So the the, the magic is getting security built in is so key. Um, it's so much more effective if it's done early. It's also then not done on the security budget as well. So making security part of business success requirements is, is really key. And there's so many examples of it being done out there successfully. Um, so the, they got one more question here. We're just about gonna run out of time. Any advice on OSS management for an enterprise? I assume that means open source security. Um, so there's a couple things. There, there are products out there that's focus on vulnerabilities and open source security and the repositories out there. Um, but to me, it's, it's, it's basically saying we need to treat open source, open source software like we do any other software. We need to treat every library, every software module, every container, every, everything as an object that needs to have um, some assurance that it's been inspected, it hasn't been changed since we last looked, and that it's something we think we should trust. If we can't, anything we can't trust, we have to monitor more closely. So again, I'll get back to that sort of overhype around zero trust. Right now, probably 90% of the software running in your enterprises, you can't really trust any more than it turned out you could trust uh, SolarWinds. Um, so we monitor our internal networks to quickly notice if somebody's found a vulnerability in Windows that we didn't know about. Well, there's a lot of software packages out there that we could focus more on if we had more trusted software out there. So open source or um, open source software or developed software internally or, or shrink wrap software we're purchasing all have that issue of uh, overall software secure development life cycle and a secure deployment life cycle that they're tested and monitored and every update is tested before we push it out think about it for years we've tested windows patches to make sure they didn't screw up our applications um well, maybe we should think of this. We can't test the Windows operating system every time to see if it's been corrupted. But for just about every software package, we should we probably should be doing that, using tools that are going to find hidden capabilities as well as uh, typical vulnerabilities and any updates from every vendor or requiring the vendors to show evidence of doing that. So with that, we're just about at the end of the session here. Um, so we've gone through the question and answers. Um, I promise you, we've listed some resources. So there's a bunch of SANS URLs where you get more information, uh, the reading room, I run the What Works program where the vendors give me users, I interview them about the business problem, the solutions they looked at, who they chose, what lessons they learned, and, and any metrics they're using. Um, it's a fun thing, one of my favorite things to do at SANS. 
the SANS News Bites newsletter. If you're not a subscriber, there's how you can subscribe. We put a lot of work into that twice a week. There's the URL where you can download a copy of the full uh, threat report. I looked through the URL. I don't think usually RSA will make the SANS RSA panel uh, a, YouTube, uh, a publicly available version that you can watch the, the full one hour presentation. There's actually a follow on uh, with uh, virtual audience questions, but I couldn't find the URL. But if you Google SANS RSA panel 2021, whenever it comes available, you'll be able to see that. If you are watching a recorded version of this webinar, send your questions to q at sans.org. Again, if it's for one of the sponsors or me or uh, maybe any, anybody, one of the instructors, send it in. We'll get the right person to get you an answer. Um, so with that, we're just about at the end of the time slot. I'm going to turn things over to back to Carol for any final words. All right. Thank you so much, John, for your great presentation. And to Anomaly, BlackBerry, Cisco, Corelight, Domain Tools, Esraha, Logarithm, Rapid7, Sophos, and Threat Quotient for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.